I'm Caro. I'm your host uh, for tonight. I'm the Education Director with NOFA Mass, and I also manage our soil health initiatives. And you are attending the session uh, hemp, Production Hemp 101 with Heather Darby and Scott Lewis. Um, so Heather Darby, uh, Dr. Heather Darby, is a professor of agronomy at the University of Vermont, where she has been designing and implementing industrial hemp research since 2016. Her research has covered grain, fiber, and flower hemp production. And through her work, she also provides regular outreach to growers across the region on hemp farming. Um, Heather has also been a big part of NOFA's work bringing no the knowledge of hemp production back to local farmers over the past few years, which we really appreciate, Heather. Um, Scott Lewins is the University of Vermont's Entomology Extension Educator and is a lecturer in the Plant and Soil Science Department. Scott has been conducting applied agricultural research on farms throughout Vermont for nearly 15 years. His background is in biological control of agricultural pests um, and the development of appropriate integrated pest management tactics for nor northeastern growers. Are you going to correct me on anything, Scott? <laughs> Good? Okay. Um, so hemp has so much promise as a multi-use uh, crop for food, fiber, soil, health, and medicine, and I'm so excited to hear what these two presenters have to tell us this evening. Um, but before we jump in, I just have a few details to review with you. Um, so we do have a number of sponsors who help to make our whoops, <laughs> help to make our conference possible. So uh, I encourage you to support them and tell them that NOFA sent you. One last note: um, throughout this conference, we will be showing you this slide, um, and this slide is just meant to uh, remind us all to um, consider the fact that the land that we are all presenting from, speaking from, researching on, living on was occupied before and inhabited and managed, the land is managed prior to European colonization. Um, I'll drop a link to uh, this map if you haven't interacted with it yet. It's highly interactive. You can look up your location and sort of get some of the history of the pre-colonial inhabitants of this land. But also just to note that um, since colonization, there's also been um, a lot of uh, different um, racist policies that have resulted in uh, most of the land in this country being owned um, by uh, white Americans and descendants of, of white immigrants. And that's part of the racial justice lens that we should think about when we think about land ownership. Um, we should always be questioning that and thinking about that when we um, move forward with land-based work. Um, so with that as a, just a framing point, um, I think we can go ahead and begin our session. And at this point, I will turn it over to Heather to start sharing. Okay, well, thank you for having me tonight. Um, we're going to just jump right in and talk about hemp. There's a lot to learn. We don't have a ton of time, so I'm going to kind of breeze through some things I hope um, maybe are, you know, common knowledge for everybody. But I just wanted to start with the plant itself and familiarize you with the plant. So hemp um, produces both male and female plants, which makes it a little bit different than most agricultural crops that we grow with, grow. So in order to produce seed um, or grain, you need to have both the male and female plants. And in order to produce fiber, you really only need uh, the female plants. And in order to produce um, essential oils like CBD or CBG or any of the terpenes, you also only want the female plants. So the female plants themselves, um, I think everybody is most familiar with what that looks like. They have a very congested flower head <clears throat> where the flowers are all really, really bound close together and we sometimes refer to that as the buds of the cannabis plant. Um, and then on those flowers, there are these stigmas that are long, and they're covered with receptive papillae, which is where, of course, the pollen would go to fertilize the plant. Um, oftentimes, it's these stigmas that we see brown up on the flowering um, bud, and that's when we start to show that the plant, the female plant itself, is getting ready to harvest. So the male plants look really different. They tend to be a little bit, um, I guess, like kind of scragglier. They're, they're taller. They tend to be taller because they want to rise above the female plants, basically to get into the airstream because most of the pollen is blown around by wind. 
blow the pollen around to make sure that it gets all the, the female flowers. So they tend to be taller than the female plants. They die really almost immediately after they shed their pollen. So if you are growing grain, you'll see these male uh, plants start to flower, and then you'll see them a few weeks later just as dead, totally brown and shriveled up plants out in the field. Um, now, bees like the pollen of males. That's really, if they're out in the field, that's what they would be visiting um, to collect pollen and um, also help a little bit with pollination. But female plants are not really a source of food for bees. So it's really the male plants that the bees are visiting. All right, so again, here's an up-close picture of the female flower. So the, the bigger picture is an unfertilized female flower, and you can see that the flowers are really tightly congested into that auxiliary inflorescence. You can, it's kind of like a pineapple, actually, if you think about a pineapple. Um, and you can see the stigma that are white kind of poking out of each flower, and as those kind of turn brown and this begins to glisten, um, those are the trichomes that are filling up with essential oils and it's becoming ready to harvest for that purpose. To the right is a fertilized female flower. Again, you can see it looks pretty different. You can actually see the seed, um, oh, I guess they're pods, <laughs> starting to form. And they're covered with a green, green bracts. And if you peel those back, you'll see a fertilized seed in there. And this plant actually right here is, is almost ready to harvest for seed. You can see some of the brown in there. That's the bracts that are dying back and peeling off, and that's when you know the seed is getting ready to harvest. So a fertilized female plant versus an unfertilized plant have very different purposes and end uses. Um, so if you're growing uh, hemp for seed, um, it's primarily, the seed itself is primarily used, you know, to make more plants um, by farmers or it's used for oil extraction. I think on my next slide. So here's the seed, hemp seed, and here's an oil press. So you would put the seed through this cold press and there's a screw in that barrel and that screw kind of pushes the seed through and crushes it. And out of the side where those little dots are there is where the oil leaks out. And that um, coming out of the end there Kind of looks like a a turd. <laughs> I don't know what else to call it. Um, that is the oil seed meal. That's what's left once the oil is extruded from the seed. And um, so this is the type of hemp seed oil that you likely find in the supermarket. Um, it's also used, you know, as kind of like a health supplement. It's not usually used as a cooking oil. Um, some people take it to enhance omega-3s in their diet. The, the meal itself is often used in baking. Some people use it as a flour or in flour. Um, it's very high in protein. It, it can be used for animal feed as well and in like uh, pet food products, things like that. So it all has value. But this type of oil is different than the oil that we hear about, the, the CBD oil or distillate or extract. And that is, is also an oil, but it's removed from the plant through um, a very different process. So it's usually removed through CO2 extraction or ethanol extraction or even a basic olive oil extraction. So the way we get the oils is very different. All right, so hemp seed oil itself, again, is it's very healthy. Um, it's got a lot of uses, but um, different, of course, than CBD oil. The fibers, um, like I said, they, they come from the female plants mostly. The fiber itself is, um, this is considered a bass fiber, and the bass fibers is what's um, peeled back here, and in the middle is what we call the herd. So the bass fibers are what make that really long, high-quality linen. So if you're, if you're, if you're um, making clothing, as an example, or, or some kind of materials or rope, 
this is what would be made from high quality vast fiber. And then you have the herd in the center, which is, is a little bit softer. And this is what like hempcrete might be made out of. Um, bedding is made out of this. There are lots of different pl uh, products as well made from that part of the hemp plant. Um, but all of these crops or end uses, they all come from the same plant, but how you grow them and the varieties that you select to produce fiber or grain um, or CBD are, are very different. And that's what we're going to talk about. Maybe if I can get to the next slide. Okay. So let's get into the basics of growing. We know that hemp is well adapted to our region. Um, it's actually adapted to a lot of regions. <laughs> and I think that's why it's, um, it's really exciting for everybody because it really is being grown in just about every state in the country. And so, you know, even though hemp has become an opportunity in our area, it's an opportunity everywhere. And that's also kind of made it um, difficult, I think, to um, keep a steady market because it's easy to flood a market when really every, every farm in the country almost can grow hemp. It can be grown in Arizona, it can be grown in Florida, it's being grown in Alaska, um, Hawaii, Vermont. So it's an opportunity for everybody. So it's very well adapted. Um, for in you know our case, it's pretty cold tolerant for the most part. It can also tolerate hot um, and arid conditions, provided that it gets a good root system. So it's been really dry this summer, and our hemp that is not being irrigated actually is doing just as well as the hemp that's being irrigated. So again, if it can set um, a good root system, it can survive even um, you know much of the drought that we've been. Um, this summer. One thing that hemp does not like is waterlogged soils, especially when it's a younger plant. And so those heavy, heavy clay soils that are, you know, predominant, at least where we are, um, it's very difficult to grow hemp, um, high yielding hemp on those types of soils. And of course, hemp loves uh, full sunlight. So as far as water requirements go, it is a crop <laughs> that requires um, a decent amount of rainfall each year. And so we ha generally have no trouble, <laughs> ha you know, providing hemp with 20 inches of rainfall during the growing season. Um, but again, most of, the, most of the rain or water that a crop needs um, uh, mat is is maximum at the time of reproduction. So as the crop grows in its like younger stages, it needs some water, but then as it begins to put on more vegetation and begins to move into the reproductive phases, that's actually when it's using an inch of water a week at least. So really right now is the critical time for this hemp for most of us, for the hemp to get um, enough water. So we do know that, um, you know, um, irrigation can help increase yields. We have seen that in our research. And it can be a very important um, management tool, but it's definitely not necessary to grow hemp in, in New England. All right, let's see if I can get to the next slide. So just a couple of tidbits, I guess. Um, one of the things we do know is when it's really hot and really dry, um, the THC and CBD content increases in the plants. And this has been shown in the literature, but we've also experienced this up at our research farm because we've been growing hemp indoors and outdoors. And when we grow it indoors um, with black plastic under cover, um, the soil is much drier and it's much hotter, and the CBD and THC levels tend to be elevated um, often a little more than we would like. So, you know, making sure that the plant is not drought stressed, especially as it's beginning to form um, and accumulate these essential oils and cannabinoids is really important because you can easily be out of compliance if the plant get way too dry and stressed. All right, so again, as I mentioned, irrigation 
can help increase yields, um, and this is up at the research farm. So when we irrigated hemp, um, we got over two pounds of dry flower bud per plant, but when we didn't, you know, we were closer to a pound and a quarter. But again, still respectable yields, even with just rain-fed hemp. And I would say this was an average year. It wasn't really dry, and it wasn't really wet. Um, so here's a photo of some waterlogged plants, just to give you a sense of, um, you know, how stressed out these plants can get, especially when they're young and there's too much water. This is grain hemp being grown, and, you know, things just <laughs> go really bad fast when there's too much water on a young plant. Um, so again, the soil limitation here really is on really heavy clays with over 40% clay. Um, you know, you, you're going to want to have some kind of drainage on those soils um, or really good high quality, high soil quality to make sure that they're not retaining too much water. Um, adequate pH is also really important. You want to make sure the pH is over 6. Um, and I'll just also note that these are big plants. If you've seen them, they put on a lot of biomass. They can be very efficient at nutrient uptake, especially if they're allowed to, you know, produce really deep roots, but they need a lot of fertility to, to grow. I mean, you think about it, the, the amount of biomass you're producing, um, it does take nutrients to grow those crops. So, you know, we often hear, oh, you know, hemp doesn't need anything to grow. And it is true, it's a pretty efficient plant um, if it gets rooted well, but it's big and it needs lots of fertility. So, again, you can have really deep, deep tap roots. Um, some of that depends on the type of soil that you have. Um, I have heard, and, I, you know, I'm not, I mean, I guess I'm as an expert as most people, but <laughs> I have heard that clones... Um, do not produce tap roots. I've heard that over and over and over again. So, you know, really, if you're growing outside, you're probably way better off to use seedlings over clones to make sure that you're producing a, a really healthy, deep root system. Okay, so this is a soil test. And again, I just, you know, want to encourage people to take a soil test. I do work for extension, so that's something we always say, take a soil test. Um, we, you know, we have a lot of beginning farmers trying to grow hemp um, and some not so beginning farmers either. And, you know, people not taking soil tests and, you know, planting into soils with pHs below 6 and, and lots of deficiencies. Um, and it costs money to grow crops. And, you know, knowing what you're starting with is really important and being able to fertilize properly um, not over fertilizing is as important as not under fertilizing because over fertilizing can cause a lot of disease issues down the road. Um, so I think people, people tend to overdo it and we've seen a lot of issues with um, diseases like powdery mildew as a result. All right, so for fertility requirements. Um, the crop requires a good amount of potassium. It's very similar to a corn crop in that way. Um, two and a half to three percent of its biomass is actually potassium. So on average, again, depending on your soil test, usually a recommendation would be between 60 and 70 pounds of potassium a year. Phosphorus um, is needed in much, uh, a much lower amounts. It only makes up half a percent of the plant's biomass. So the plant needs far more potassium than it does phosphorus. Um, you can see here I have a recommendation of 50 to 70 pounds. And again, this is if your soil test is testing low to medium, that's what you would likely be putting on. And same with um, potassium. Nitrogen is really the top nutrient that this crop takes up and needs. So if you're seeing deficiencies, again, depending on your soil test, um, if you've added everything else, it, it might very well be um, a nitrogen deficiency. So hemp removes, you know, 100 to 200 and upwards pounds of nitrogen per acre. So it is a very nitrogen-needy crop. Um, and we found through our research at this point 
that it takes about um, 125 pounds of nitrogen applied to the plant um, per acre. And, and that's kind of what our research has shown so far for the Northeast. But again, that'll range depending on your soil type, um, path management, and um, yield, yield goals as well. Um, okay, with most of these nutrients, especially if you need a lot of them, you don't want to be um, dumping it all on at one time. So with nitrogen, you want to apply the nitrogen in the vegetative stage. So you want to have all the nitrogen applied before you start, before flowering really starts. And flowering, depending on the variety, is starting right about now in most places. So you want to be done with most of your nitrogen applications at this point. And I would advise people to split that 100 to 125 pounds up over the duration of the vegetative stage instead of putting it all on at once. Um, there is a fear that adding too much nitrogen can reduce THC. Some people say if you add too much nitrogen, it'll increase THC. We haven't actually seen either of those things happen. Um, we applied nitrogen up to 200 pounds per acre, and we didn't see any difference. Um, but again, I think if you're over applying at flowering, there could be some negative impacts. Okay. Um, what, oops, has a slight delay. All right. So um, end deficiencies are plants turning yellow. They, they uh, get very chlorotic. Hemp tends to light up um, when it's unhappy. So it will definitely tell you when it needs something. Sometimes it's hard to turn the plants around once you do see the deficiencies. So, you know, again, get your soil test and get things in order. Um, we have seen this, that too much nitrogen can stimulate the formation of male flowers. Um, I've mostly seen this in our grain crops. But again, I think if you're applying it over time in split applications, that is less likely to happen. Um, so phosphorus, um, hemp uses most of its phosphorus at flowering. So you just want to make sure that you have um, optimum soil test phosphorus when you're planting. If, you're, if you are in the optimum range, you don't need to add anything more during flowering. But if you have low phosphorus, making sure that you have ample amounts at, at flowering is really important. Um, and so with potassium, it's actually the opposite. <laughs> You want to make sure the potassium is put on at the front of the season. You do not want to put the potassium on when flowering occurs because um, there will be some negative impl implications from that. All right, micronutrients. We hear a ton about micronutrients from people, um, mostly I would say in the marijuana world, you know, there's a lot on the internet about feeding plants with everything you can possibly think of. Um, there is evidence, you know, that mi micronutrient deficiencies are observed in hemp. Of course, um, micronutrient deficiencies can be observed in any crop. Um, but here's a couple of, you know, tidbits. Usually, um, if you have light textured soils, like very sandy soils that are really low in organic matter, and you haven't added any compost or, or animal manures ever, um, then you may consider putting on a micronutrient pack when you plant, because that's a condition where you ver very may likely see a micronutrient deficiency. And again, if the pH isn't within between 6 and 7, you may also see a micronutrient deficiency. Um, magnesium is reported on your soil test. If your magnesium is low, you need to add it, um, and your soil test should tell you to add it. Um, and then boron is another nutrient that hemp needs a lot of. Um, and you can see 250 grams of boron per acre. Now, how do you put on 250 grams? <laughs> per acre, not per plant. Um, 
So I think, you know, again, if you are in on light texture soil with low organic matter, putting on a micronutrient pack that's, you know, really widely available, mixing that in with your other fertilizer is the way to get to get these on the ground. All right. Um, growing, or do we have any questions on that? That's a lot of detailed information. Um, um, I just wanted to say, I think uh, for organic producers, you have to demonstrate um, a specific deficiency in a micronutrient in order to be allowed to apply it. So, I, so some organic growers, is that correct? M might not be able to apply like a full spectrum micronutrient. Um, is that what a yeah, pack is? That is true. You're, oh, go ahead. Sorry, Nina. Oh, no, I was just asking um, if that's what a pack, what a pack is. Yeah, so um, usually you can get a mixture of micronutrients, um, both organic and conventional. And I think demonstrating that you need it can still come from a soil test. It doesn't necessarily have to be a deficiency in the plant. And actually, you shouldn't wait till you see a deficiency, mm. especially um, because deficiencies can be really hard to turn around um, on plants. I mean, you can use foliar applications and things like that. But a soil test will give you an indication of micronutrients. Um, and again, if you have these other conditions, you should be able to justify that it's needed. Great. And, so and Nina was wondering. Um, oh, sorry. There's a little bit of a delay. I apologize. Um, Nina was wondering how much magnesium is uh, recommended in the soil, um, and she said she might have missed it if you if you said this, but. Can you recommend yeah, this? I didn't say that, but um, usually what I see in New England is, you know, about 50 pounds. And magnesium can be put on organically through Sopo Mag. That's a really common way to put it on. It also applies sulfur, potassium, and magnesium. Um, if you need lime, you can also put on high mag lime and get the magnesium that way. So there are different ways um, to get it on the ground. Great. But it's usually um, not more than 50 pounds. Great, thank you. Um, and while we're asking you questions, uh, earlier Nina asked, um, what is it about female plants that makes them better for fiber? So just stepping back from the nutrients for a second. Um, they're just, they tend to be more prevalent. <laughs> I think actually what I've heard is the male plants make better fiber, oh. but, um, but they tend to be less prevalent um, in the field with the current varieties that are grown. But I have heard in other countries such as China, they rogue out the females to get the males for fiber. I don't know if that's true, but I've heard that. Yeah, I'll just, I'll step in really quickly. Heather, I've heard the same thing, and it's because earlier you mentioned that the male flower, uh, the male plants are, are generally taller, so the space between mm -hmm. the, the nodes is longer, so the fibers themselves are mm -hmm. longer, so I've heard that same thing. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. I think that's all the questions we have for now. Thank you. Okay. So I'm going to um, talk a little bit about growing grain and fiber because it is very different than growing um, hemp for CBD or CBG production. So um, usually hemp, growing hemp for grain or fiber is very much like growing a cereal grain, so like barley or wheat. And you use a grain drill to plant with, and your seeding rate is, 20 to 25 pounds for grain per acre of seed and 40 to 50 pounds um, per acre of seed if you're growing for fiber. So the seeding rate increases for fiber because really what you're after are long, thin stems. Excuse me. So you pack the plants closer together to produce um, taller plants and smaller stems. If, and again, that's for what would be considered sort of high quality fiber, so fiber that would be going to ropes or, or linen um, or fabrics to the textile industry. But there um, is a lot of grain slash fiber crops being grown, especially in Canada. So they're dual purpose crops um, where the grain is harvested first and then they go back through and mow down the stems and that gets baled up and that fiber is, you know, chipped up for bedding um, and used in hempcrete and some other products. 
So, you know, the type of fiber that m most people are looking for at this point is not um, high-grade fi fiber. It's not for the textile industry, not in the United States or Canada. So most people are, are growing a dual-purpose crop. Um, fertility needs for grain and fiber, that's kind of the range um, that we see. These are Canadian recommendations. We haven't gotten that far with um, northeast recommendations, but I will say our nitrogen requirement is a little bit higher. And again, that primarily is because we receive um, generally high rainfall, so we get more leaching. The average grain yield is um, a quarter to just under a ton, and that's a Canadian average. That's the same um, yields that we see here in the northeast. We've, we've seen very high yields of grain, you know, a couple of tons, but I would say the average is, you know, about a thousand pounds of grain per acre. So variety selection, like any crop, is really important, and there are varieties that are specific for fiber production. Here are a few that are listed here. Um, most of these come out of, of Europe, Poland, Italy, um, France. Uh, I, I don't think there's any um, fiber-specific varieties that come out of Canada. So these that are listed here are mostly out of Europe. And you can see there really is a, a pretty significant difference in the bass fiber content um, of those varieties. We've done some of this evaluation here, and we have most of these varieties in our trials as well. Um, so we're kind of looking at the same info here in the Northeast. So this is us planting um, hemp for grain. And you can see, again, there's a grain drill on the back of this planter. So we just use a standard grain drill. The rows are, you know, seven inches apart and um, planted to about a half to an inch deep. Here's just a picture of those flowers again. The grain itself is harvested with a combine, and there are some special um, combines. They're not special combines. They're heads, special heads that are used to harvest hemp. We just use the same combine we use for everything else, and it works fine. It's, it's very difficult to harvest hemp. You can see how tall it is. Um, you've got to lift your um, your combine head up as high as you can because you really just want the grain um, off the seed heads. So we're just trying to clip off the heads and put that through the combine. It's really messy. It's green, which is really different than other grain crops. Um, and there's a lot of trash in the seed. So it's, it's a, it definitely takes time to harvest. This is harvesting for fiber. Um, this individual is just using a sickle bar. You harvest for fiber. Um, actually, ooh, that's reminding me. We need to harvest our fiber plots. <laughs> You're supposed to har harvest for fiber um, before, you know, right when the males are shedding pollen, basically, or right before that, which was probably two weeks ago. So anyway, we're behind on that. Um, and, you know, so this is actually a pretty early season crop, would be a great crop for the Northeast because you'd be harvesting really in July, early August. And then you harvest for grain around Labor Day. So both of those are really nice early season crops that then you could put something in um, to that field after that. So um, you could plant small grains or um, some other crops as well or definitely get your cover crops in. So you can see with the fiber, it's just being mowed down here, and then it's picked up. It's dried, and then it's picked up. Let me see if I can get to my next. Here we go. So this is beautiful fiber redding in a field in Canada where they don't get a lot of precipitation. And this would work well for us this year, but I think the biggest issue we have in the Northeast with producing really high-grade fiber is the fact that we get a lot of rain and humidity. So this nice golden fiber, we've never seen this, not here, not in the years that we've mowed the fiber and tried to let it ret. It rests really quickly because there's a lot of moisture, and retting just means rot, I think, in, in French or 
some other language, but <laughs> it rots really quickly. So if you're in a very dry place, they it's just like morning dew that helps with the redding process. And, you know, so so for us to create a really high-end fiber product would be, I think, it would be challenging. Um, but most of the fiber here, like I said, is dual purpose. So after you harvest the grain, they're windrowing the stalks and baling them up um, and using them in uh, like hempcrete and building products. I don't know why this goes so slow. Go. There we go. Um, yeah, so here are our grain yields, just 16 to 17. And we've actually done this for a number of years. And it goes up and it goes down depending on the year. 2016 was the, um, like, beginner's luck. And then 2017, like, reality set in. And then 2018, I think we got about 1,000 pounds. 2019, we're back at 600 pounds of grain. And this year, I'm hoping for a good, good yield. But um, the birds eat it. Um, so the birds came in and wiped out our crop in 18, really, or, yeah, I think it was 18. Um, <clears throat> so birds eat it. It's, um, like I said, it's really difficult to harvest, and it's really difficult to get a good stand. As far as planting date for hemp, I'm going to use all the time here. i got to hurry up. Um, as far as planting date for grain or fiber, and actually even for um, CBD, if you can get it in by the second week of June, I think that is really ideal. And you can see that's not what this graph shows. <laughs> but the point of this graph, um, oh, I hit my button too fast. Come on. Um, is what what we've seen over the years is that establishing hemp from seed is very difficult. And this is probably in my mind where the most, this is actually the most challenging aspect of growing hemp for fiber or grain. And really as we're moving into larger scale CBD production, people are planting from seed. They are not planting from seedlings. And establishing a, a good stand of hemp in the field is very, very difficult. And it is just, uh, it, it has low germ. Um, it's just, I don't know, I can't even, I don't even know what all the issues are. Um, fungal issues, the soil conditions here are horrible as you can see, but a crop like corn can get through this. A crop like hemp cannot. It cannot withstand any crusting um, at all. So everything has to be perfect to get excellent germination. We planted twice last year. The first time we got 42% germ. The second time we got 72% germ. Um, this year I planted three times. It was almost the same thing. So it's just the conditions have to be perfect to get a really solid stand of hemp which leads up to the higher yields, um, no weeds. If you get a good stand, you will not see a single weed in your grain field or your fiber field. Um, and so the stand issue, you have to have excellent soil quality. Um, and so, you know, here is just a graph showing our grain populations in 16 and 17. And you can see we had, um, 50 plants, less than 50 plants per meter squared um, in 16, and in 17, we had less than 40 plants per meter square, um, and we're planting six, it's only 40% of what we put in the ground, so we're losing 60% of the seed, and in 17, we lost 70%. So... <laughs> This, to me, is like the biggest challenge, and, and this is our fourth, fifth year doing this, and just when I think I've gotten it right, you know, something goes wrong, so, all right. So weed management, like I said, if you get that really good stand, so this is all hemp in here. This is an excellent stand of hemp planted from seed. Um, once it gets out of the ugly teenager stage, which is this stage, it really takes off. And even if there are a few weeds in here, nothing, nothing can outcompete the hemp. Um, 
but you know, if you're missing a plant every six inches, that's just room for weeds to grow. So the, the sand is critical, and especially with organic management. And there aren't really any herbicides approved for hemp at this point, but there will be. But in organic, you know, it is a really great crop for organic, but the key, again, is getting that solid stand um, right out of the starting gate. Okay. Um, all right. So I was going to talk a little bit about purchasing seed unless there's any questions. Any questions, folks? I guess not. All right. We can proceed. Okay, here we go. Yeah, so purchasing seeds, when you purchase grain and, or seeds to be planted to produce grain or fiber, you're going to get male and female seeds. Um, and that's okay. That's what you want. You have to have both, um, at least with grain. And most of this seed at this point is easily accessible. Um, you know, it's coming in through Canada and a little bit through Europe. There are seed distributors throughout the U.S. now. And locally, there's King's AgriSeed, there's Seedway. There's a number of places that are handling seed that's coming out of Canada. Um, so that is relatively easy. It's about, I want to say it's uh, $200 for a 50-pound bag. And a 50-pound bag, um, as you could see, can seed, you know, one to two acres, depending on what you're growing. Uh, okay, so CBD, CBD clone, CBD starts. I say CBD, but anything that's being grown for essential oils or smokable uh, flower bud, you know, you have lots of choices here. Um, you can purchase seed that is not feminized. So that when you put it in the ground, you will end up with males. And usually it's about 50-50, 50, 50, 50 males, 50 females, at least in this case. Um, and so if you only want females, you're going to spend some time roguing, you know, culling out the males, and you have to be super diligent because obviously one male can ruin all of the female plants. Most people purchase feminized seed, so it goes through um, – quite a process so that essentially the plant is only producing um, seed that will produce a, a female plant. And I don't know, is this allowed in organic? I'm not even sure. I'm not sure because the process uses um, different chemicals to basically stress the plant. So I don't, I don't know. I know it was up for debate, but Anyway, most people are using feminized seed, which um, hedges their bets that they will get female plants, but it's not guaranteed. Um, oftentimes, there's still male plants that occur if you're growing from feminized seed. So those are your two choices. Feminized seed is usually about a buck a piece, and unless you're buying bulk, um, and sometimes you can get a break, but usually it's around a dollar and can be higher. Um, you can buy CBD clones. Those will be female and because they're taken from female plants. They range, again, it really depends, but anywhere from I've seen $3 clones up to $10 clones. So they're much more expensive. And then you can have um, starts, you know, just like you would for your uh, veggie farm, tomatoes or cucumbers. So you just take the seed and you generate a, you know, a little seedling. And I think that's what most people at this point are using, are start. Um, certificate of analysis. So if you're buying seed, especially, or any seed, you have to have a certificate of analysis. I'm not, I'm, uh, I'm not overly familiar with the UMAS, with mass rules, but they're stricter than Vermont rules. Um, so any seed you purchase, you know, really needs to come with a certificate saying um, that it meets the THC requirements of 0.3%. Now, I always say buyer beware because just because this piece of paper says that doesn't mean that that's what will happen in your field. 
stop shaking his head. I mean, we've, I think last year we grew a variety that came with a COA and it produced 4% THC reliably. <laughs> so um, it is buyer beware. My suggestion is to be buying seed from a reputable source, and there actually are some nowadays. Um, so caution there. All right, I'm going to skip through some of this. Um, just to give you a sense of yields and CBD content, so what I have learned over the years is that if your plant is going to be compliant, it's not going to produce 20% um, CBD. And this is, um, you know, coming out of some genetic work that's being done now that basically if your plant's compliant, it's probably producing more like 10% CBD. So in our trials, not compliant meant that it was over 1% THC because that's the allowable level in Vermont right now. With the new USDA regulations, it will be 0.3 for everybody. So when I said this was compliant last year, it might have been over 0.3, but it wasn't over 1% total THC. So non-compliant, these were over 1%, and the rest were not. But you can see, um, you know, we, we did have some around 12% CBD, but we, don't, we didn't generally have anything that was 20%. 20, 20 and as far as yields go, this is the flower yields that we were seeing. Um, and we saw yields that range from about 1,000 pounds of dry matter per acre um, up to um, around over 3,000 pounds of flower bud per acre. So you can get quite, quite a large yield off of some of these plants. But it doesn't really mean anything if it doesn't meet the, the regulations. So, all right, I don't want to go on too long, Scott. I know we're going to 8.30, but you have 30 minutes. I thought we were going at to 12.30. <laughs> ah. Um, yeah, okay, so I'll talk about uh, plant spacing. So most people are planting in, like, this, this five by five formation. So five feet between plants, five feet on all, in all directions. Um, and that seems to work for people. Six by six, you know, is also good. Um, you can grow these plants one by one. You can grow these plants 18 inches apart if you want for CBD. But there are some downsides to any method. Um, if you're growing five by five or six by six, you need less plants, less seed, less investment on that end. Um, if you're growing plants two feet apart, you can see you need 10,890 plants, which, you know, at a buck a seed adds up fast. Um, so most people, I think, are sticking with this larger plant spacing at this point. Um, but out west, where they're kind of larger scale harvesters and, you know, more commodity type farming, they are definitely planting um, with grain drills seeds 18 inches apart. So, um, but I think we'll probably stick with this wider spacing here. Um, so we did some research on this, and if you look at the dry matter bud yield per plant, you can see if we plant the plants five feet apart, we're getting a, over a pound of dry flower bud per plant. If they're a foot apart, um, we're getting way less than a pound, 0.08 of a pound. And so there's less yield per plant, but there's more yield per acre. Um, and, you know, a lot of people look at this data and they say, oh, well, then I should, you know, I should plant the plants closer together and get more yield per acre. But it also costs. Uh, a lot more for the seed. And so is that increased yield worth that investment? So it's really trying to figure out, um, you know, what planting scheme is going to work best for you based on what you're going to get paid at the end of the day for the, for the flower bud. 
spot, any, any of these arrangements work. Planning date, really the same thing as with grain and fiber. If we can get those plants planted um, by the, you know, sort of second week of June, we maximize yield. We also maximize um, CBD content and essential oils and terpenes. And, you know, I think the reason for that is um, because they have more time to develop in the fall. So these plants, even though it's just a week ahead of time or two weeks, um, the CBD levels were two percentage points higher in the earlier planting date. So I think it makes sense to try to get those plants in by June. All right. So we already talked about this. Again, most people are transplanting hemp from seedlings. You know, different ways to do that. A lot of people are using plastic culture. Um, I know a lot of people are trying to get away from plastic culture. It's all possible. There's no one way to do it that maximizes yield. I've seen good yield a variety of ways. Um, you know, if you have plastic culture, you need to have um, irrigation under it. So, you know, that can be a complication for some people. Some people are transplanting with machines, some people are not. Um, like I said, there's lots of ways to do this. <laughs> people are spraying between alleys if they're not organic. They're organic, they're mowing, weed whacking. Um, some people are cover cropping. So, like I said, there's success in doing it many ways. We're really interested in cover cropping between the rows and that's what we do. Um, and if you have plants five by five, you can mow in all directions, you know, um, and take care of the take care of the cover crop or the weeds. So, all right. Um, I just want to talk about removing the male plants. This is something that people get really hung up on, um, and it's really important as the plants move to flowering that you get rid of all the males. You can see here, this is a little flower or pollen sac that's going to open up here on a male plant. And on the female plant, you can see those little stigmas poking out. So you have to be really diligent. You have to be out there every day looking because your female plants can produce male appendages. And, um, and that's tricky. So you need to just constantly be walking the field. So harvest timing, this is also, you know, up for debate. Some people um, look under the microscope and start to see when the trichomes start to turn dark in color or cloudy. So here are trichomes right here. You have to have a microscope to be able to do this. Um, some people start to harvest when the plant gets really sticky. Some people start to harvest when those stigmas turn brown. Um, Probably the best thing is to send in your sample and see where your CBD and THC levels are through a lab and then go from that point. But there is no hard science around this at this point. Um, harvesting for flower, most people are hand harvesting or using some type of mechanical um, labor or mechanical mechanization combined with hand harvest. You know, hand harvest, I mean, Scott can attest to this. Ugh. I mean, some plants take hours, hours to harvest. Um, and you can see here I have one to three hours per plant. So, you know, it is very labor intensive. That's for the flower market. But even for biomass, which is, you know, includes some stems and some leaves, it's still very time consuming. So we've combined um, hand harvest with mechanical harvesting. And there are all types of harvesters being produced. This is a modified tobacco harvester that basically just cuts the plants in the field. They go up this little conveyor and it lays them on a bed. But then to me, that's the easy part. The real work begins when you have to start breaking the plant down. So you can see here there's different types of mechanization that people have come up with to harvest hemp. Um, but it's really expensive. And, you know, most likely in the Northeast, we're going to be going for smaller acreage, higher value. Um, and using some of these harvesting tools, this is a bucker over to the left. So you stick your stems through those holes on the top. And there's rollers in the back that grab the stem 
and then all the buds and leaves pop off. So that helps reduce some of the labor. The thing in the middle is a leaf trimmer. Um, buddies, that again is another type of um, bucker that can be bought. So once you get it harvested, it has to be dried. <laughs> and there's ways to do that too, simple ways, complex ways. This is a, a hop dryer out in the Pacific Northwest, but it does have to be dried. And this is an issue for people. I mean, these are huge plants. So if a plant is five foot in all directions and you need to hang it up somewhere and you have thousands of them, you know, it's easy to do the math to figure out you don't have enough room. So, um, you know, plan to not be able to harvest it and plan to have to hang it up in a barn or somewhere dry um, to dry it and figure out how much space you're going to need. It takes a lot of space. I think we hung 40 plants and it took up half a barn. So, you can buy dryers. Um, they're becoming more more um, common. Um, okay, I think I'll end with that. I was and Scott, you can. This is a little bit about pricing. I haven't looked at the prices lately, but this was April last year. This is when people were getting crazy. Um, this is why so much acreage went into the ground because we were paying, you know, four dollars per percent CBD, and this was giving you know returns per acre of forty thousand dollars. So this is why everybody planted hemp. But then that dropped, and now it's like ninety nine cents, I think. So here's uh, this was December. So just as everybody got their crop in, those. Pr prices plummeted from, you know, almost $5 in some cases to less than a dollar. So there was no market um, at that point. All right, and if you need to do uh, some budgeting, there are some great enterprise budgets on the um, University of Kentucky website. So, all right, there you go, Scott. I take all your time? Yep. No, you left me with a half Any hour. We're good. Okay. Nobody's any allowed questions? to ask any questions. <laughs> yeah. Uh, if anyone has any questions sharing. about what Heather has presented so far, now would be a good, a good time. And then I will go into some of the pests uh, that we've been dealing with here in the Northeast. Who said the and storm is can't. rolling in? I just saw that, Carol. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's a storm rolling in upstairs. I hear screaming. So if you hear any, yeah, the kids. Screaming. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> okay, go Scott. Yeah. Any questions, folks? I guess not. All right. So, uh, as Heather mentioned, um, we've been doing hemp research here in Vermont for for a few years, um, and uh, I've been working with Heather's team for a number of years, and so um, when we started looking looking at hemp production uh, in in Vermont, uh, she asked me to start to get to know some of the the pests um, that are found in hemp uh, fields, and so I'm going to share some of that information um, with you all. So really, the most important thing is understanding the system that you're working in. Um, so I, being able to identify um, what's out there is crucial, and then obviously what you do. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the most common, um, and I'm saying most common from a Vermont perspective, which might be slightly different than, um, you know, in um, Eastern Mass or something like that that's um, a little bit further away from here. Um, so I'm gonna talk not just about the bad things, um, but also some of the good things. There are beneficial um, insects. It's my bias as, um, as <clears throat> Siri, excuse me, uh, Caro mentioned, my background is in biological control. Uh, and so I'll try not to spend the entire time talking about that. Um, but I will, I will share a little uh, tidbits of info there. And then also some of the additional information um, that we've been able to um, glean or uh, others have shared with us about uh, integrated pest management in hemp. Um, talking about the economics um, and then also some control strategies uh, that you might be able to employ. Um, so probably the most common uh, insect pest, at least, that we see in Vermont are aphids, and particularly the cannabis aphid, but there are other aphids that you'll find uh, on hemp. 
Um, and all aphids are pretty much the same in their biology and, and their management as well. Um, so they're found all over the plant. You'll see them mainly on the underside of the leaves. Um, they are asexual, um, but there are also sexual forms. So the winged forms are sexual um, and the wingless forms are asexual. They actually um, reproduce um, through a process called parthenogenesis, which don't worry about that. What you should remember is that basically they're born pregnant. So the females are born with, with pregnant clones of themselves um, inside of them. Um, so that always blows my mind. So I always like to share that about them. Um, and so why you care is because that means that they can, their populations can just explode over a really short period of time. Uh, Cause they don't need to mess around with all that sex business. They can just pop out clones of themselves that have clones of themselves inside them. So um, in particularly as the, the season progresses the, those populations um, can really start to start to increase. Um, you also care about them because they suck the life out of your, your hemp plants. So they feed on the flow um, essentially the hemp sap. Um, and so you don't really see any symptoms, um, except in some cases that the, they secrete a little sugary substance um, called honeydew, and that sugary substance can promote uh, sooty mold. Um, and so other than that, you won't n really see any uh, symptoms, um, but they do really slow down um, the plant growth by reducing the, the plant vigor. Um, really, really, really high populations, you'll see wilting, curling of the leaves, yellowing, that sort of thing. Uh, the other big one is two-spotted spider mites. Um, again, very small, even smaller than the aphids. You'll see them mainly on the underside of the leaves when the populations are slowly growing. Uh, hot, dry uh, conditions like we uh, have been experienced um, promote uh, spider mite uh, population growth. Um, but as those populations grow, you start to see a stippling on the leaf. So let's see, I don't know if you see my cursor here, but this picture here uh, from Colorado shows the, the stippling, um, which is characteristic of spider mites. And then as the populations grow even more, you'll see the webbing that's characteristic. So that where they get their name, spider mite from, is because they produce webbing. And then they live protected underneath that webbing. And then they use the webbing as like little super highways to get between um, the parts of the plant. Um, and so when you've got that um, webbing on your, in this case, this is the, the female flower, but you can also see it on the leaves. Um, that's when populations um, are, are really uh, out of control. Um, to my knowledge, I don't know for sure about mass. I assume uh, it's not in Massachusetts, but I know at this point that it's not known to be in Vermont. Um, this is a problem in some other big hemp growing regions of the, of the US. And so, uh, so hemp growers are, are sort of on the lookout for the hemp russet mite. These guys are even smaller. You can't see them with the naked eye. You need magnification. Um, and what they do is again, they cause this, this curling up uh, of the leaves. The, the leaves get bronze in color um, and really severe infestations um, um, suppress the, the growth of the plant. Just wanna, okay, cool, I got plenty of time here. Um, European corn borers are pretty common in hemp. They're actually common in, in like hundreds of, um, of plant species. Um, so obviously they get their name because they um, are a major pest in corn. Um, hemp is not their preferred host, um, but they can damage the stalks uh, during their first generation. Uh, and if there's a second generation, um, in, um, which, which is based on how much um, uh, degree days have accumulated. So in Massachusetts, for sure, there are two, two flights each year. Uh, in most parts of Vermont, there are two flights each year. It's the second flight. So the first flight, um, they bore into the stem uh, and they can cause lodging. Um, and uh, that can be a problem, um, but the plants can, can rebound, uh, especially if it's one of those, those side branches that, that lodge um, off. Um, the problem is the second flight. So you get a warm year like this year, you get a second flight um, relatively early. Um, and in August, and then that second flight, you can see the picture here I've got is a European corn borer that has bored into the flower uh, and just completely annihilated um, the flower. That's a, you know, you get basically unmarketable yields um, because of the damage that they, that they do. Um, and so it's kind of sporadic when you see damage from corn borer. Um, last year, uh, it was just a, a, a whole bunch of factors that, that were working against growers, but um, last year was really wet spring. 
and the corn wasn't, uh, wasn't able to be planted uh, on time in most areas. And so as a result, there weren't the corn hosts um, all, over, all across the landscape. And so the moths were looking for something to lay their eggs on. All this hemp had just appeared. Um, and so you wound up with a lot of damage uh, in hemp as a result of corn borers. Uh, Japanese beetle, also another really common pest, also not generally um, favored. Um, hemp is not generally favored uh, by Japanese beetles. <clears throat> They're pretty generalized in their feeding. They feed on, a again, a wide variety of host plants. Um, the grubs feed on roots, uh, which generally is not a problem in hemp, but it's the adults, um, the beetles that will feed on, on the leaves, <clears throat> and they chew the leaves up like this. Um, but they, the timing of those is such that they're not generally a big uh, issue for hemp growers um, because they show up uh, end of June, beginning of July, um, and are gone by the beginning of August. And so they'll skeletonize the leaf uh, of your hemp plants, but they're gone before, uh, generally before flower formation. Uh, and so you're not, you know, harvesting the leaves. So a little bit of damage uh, is not too much of, a, of an issue. Flea beetles, another common pest. There's a whole bunch of different species of flea beetles. Um, and these are really small uh, leaf beetles. So they chew on the leaves and they cr create, this is a picture on a, a brassica. It's not a hemp leaf, but you could, it's nice. It shows those pock marks uh, from the feeding and they chew all the way through. And as the plant grows, um, you see these um, like little shotgun holes through the leaves. So if you see a whole bunch of tiny little holes, that's, that's as a result of flea beetle uh, damage. And again, there's a whole bunch of different species. They don't prefer hemp, but they will feed on it. Um, and particularly when you have a large population of flea beetles that correspond with um, young plants, that's the most concerning, uh, like critical um, uh, time period. There are two generations of adults. It's actually one generation a year, but they overwinter as adults. So the, sp the spring generation is, the, is the, the, the babies from the previous year. And so they, adults come out, they feed, they mate, um, and then they have a larval generation during the summer underground that are feeding on roots, generally not a problem. Um, the, the larval feeding is not a problem. And then uh, there'll be a second generation, um, which is their offspring that emerge um, and in late August. So you get a second generation uh, of adults, which is really just the overwintering generation for the next season. Um, Potato leafhoppers, also really common pest, also not generally favored, uh, or hemp is not generally favored by leafhoppers, um, but it can do some damage. So leafhoppers um, are a gift each year from the south. They get blown in on wind currents. Actually, they go up to the, to the Midwest first and then get blown over. And so just pay attention to your friends in Michigan and Ohio. And when they start talking about leafhoppers, then you know that they're gonna be coming here the following week. Um, and so they blow over on wind currents. The adults are the winged form. Um, and then the nymphs don't have wings. So um, it's really common in June. Usually the beginning of June is when they, is when they first show up, but it, the exact date can change. Um, this year was a relatively early year. So they got blown in early. We've had a warm summer. And so they've had more time to, to reproduce and have multiple generations. Uh, and so that's why it's been particularly bad on, on a bunch of crops, including hemp. Um, and so um, this damage, which is characteristic of potato leaf hoppers, is called hopper burn. Um, it's actually a, as a result of the feeding. So when they stick their mouth parts into your plant and suck the life out of your plant, they also inject a, um, a saliva, which has enzymes, and those enzymes cause cell death. And so that's why you see that hopper burn. Uh, a couple other things I'll mention really quickly, thrips. Um, not a huge problem, um, but again, warm years like we're experiencing this year mean multiple generations. And, and as those generations um, go by, the populations build up. And so again, you see that same sort of stippling, but it's almost like a streaking. Uh, so it's different than spider mites uh, and there's no webbing. Tarnished plant bugs have been really bad this year. Excuse me, they're not generally a problem for um, if you're growing flower. Um, but if you're growing for seed, they actually feed on the developing 
um, flowers and can cause an abortion of that flower. Um, and so they can be problematic. There are other plant bugs that will feed on the leaves, um, but those aren't really um, a huge deal because they just cause damage of the cells in the leaf. And so you get a little brown spot on the leaf uh, as a result of their feeding. Um, it's when they feed on the flowers that they, they cause economic damage. Um, it's really important not just to go out there and look for the bad things, but also look for the good things. And we'll get, uh, get to the why in a moment, but basically whatever you do to affect the bad things is also going to impact the good things. Um, and these guys are out there doing the hard work for you all season long. Um, so your pest populations are not generally going to um, require you to take action as a result of um, these guys um, keeping, keeping the populations relatively low. Um, for much of the season. So um, we actually were out today, saw a bunch of lacewing adults. Um, so the, the larvae are, have these honk and mouth parts. They just go to town on, on aphids. Um, other things like ladybugs are great, parasitoid wasps um, and, um, and the like. Um, there are also predatory spider mites, sorry, predatory mites that feed on spider mites and predatory beetles that feed on um, spider mites. But my all time favorite, um, are these hoverflies, which look like bees. Um, they're not, but they have predaceous maggots as babies. So their babies are these like aphid munching machines that just go around um, going to town on all the aphids that are feeding on your house. So um, they're also great because they're pollinators as adults. So these are like the double whammy of, of beneficials. All right, so then we have powdery mildew. We're moving into some of the um, disease um, causing pathogens. So um, powdery mildew is an obligate parasite, which means it needs a, um, a host plant, a live host plant to feed on. Um, so this white powdery um, looking substance, um, those are actually chains of spores that make up um, that um, white powdery substance. Um, so those are actually um, the mycelium, which is like the body, if you will, of the, of the um, pathogen. Um, and then there are all these chains of spores all over. And so that on the top of the leaf causes that characteristic powder, powdery look. Uh, it's interesting because for this particular um, pathogen, free moisture actually inhibits infection. So as a result, um, good aeration um, is really important for powder, powdery mildew um, uh, management. Um, I'll get to management in a, in a moment, but um, this is what it looks like uh, as the, as the um, problem uh, progresses. So on the left-hand side here, you see just those little splotches uh, on the top side of the leaf. Um, and then a really bad scenario here, you see that um, all those mycelia on the chains of spores all over the surface of the leaves uh, and buds. Gray mold, uh, which is caused by botrytis. Um, this is also a really common um, pathogen, uh, disease causing pathogen on cannabis. Uh, now these guys don't need a live host uh, to survive, which makes their management uh, a little bit more challenging. Um, and so this is the life cycle, which I'm not gonna spend too much time because I want to leave time for questions. Um, but basically, the, the important take-home message from this is um, this stage right here um, is the overwintering stage or the stage that makes it survive harsh conditions. And so um, if you've got uh, harsh conditions with no live host plant, um, this particular path pathogen is able to go into sort of a dormant phase. Um, and so again, um, just by removing infected tissue um, is not simply gonna remove the problem like with um, powdery mildew. Uh, a couple of other really common um, pathogens, uh, at least in Vermont, um, uh, sclerotinia or white mold, uh, a couple of pictures um, that I pulled from, from Cornell's website. Um, now these guys, are, they're not, so powdery mildew, the, the pathogen that causes the problem is unique for the most part to cannabis. So it's not the same powdery mildew on like your, you know, cucumbers, for instance, it's a, a different pathogen. Um, and so there's not a concern um, between, you know, um, like I said, your, 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 the, the powdery mildew in your cu cucumbers is not going to infect um, your, your hemp plants. There are a couple of other um, species of of plants. I think strawberries are one um, where it's the same pathogen. Um, so it, really important um, management strategy for this guy is to just make sure that you um, rotate with um, a non-host plant 
um, like a cereal grain or something like that. Um, and then you don't have the problem persisting. Um, and the flip side is um, broadleaf, leaf, broadleaf weeds can, can kind of keep a population of sclerotinia going. And so weed management um, is really important for this guy. Uh, pythium root rot, particularly indoor um, production, but you wind up with the, let's see if you can see my cursor here, um, the outer cortex of the, of the root slides off um, as a result of the, the pythium root rot. Um, and so it can be an issue for, for seedlings and transplant. And pythium can also cause uh, damping off. Um, outdoor production is more common to see septoria leaf splat. Um, and this is, if I remember correctly, it's really as a result of the splashing up. Um, and, and so if you're growing on plastic, um, one of the benefits is you don't get as much splash. Um, and so you don't get as many uh, issues with leaf spot. So there are a bunch of leaf spot um, disorders. Uh, I think septoria is probably the most common, at least, at least from my experience uh, in hemp. Um, and so again, avoiding that splash and, and adequate spacing um, can really help uh, limit leaf spots. All right, so really quickly, um, I'm gonna just talk basics of integrated pest management. Um, and really, you know, it's, it's a very cynical view of, of integrated pest management is it's purely an economic um, sort of framework to understand, right? You've got injury, right? That's the physical harm or destruction that's caused um, by a pest, whether it's a disease or a pathogen or whatever. Um, and then there's the damage. So how much money are you actually going to lo lose as a result of the injury? Um, and so you really wanna ask yourself two questions, how much loss is being caused and how much does it cost to control? Right. Um, and, and I love the Japanese beetle example um, because again, there's damage, um, sorry, there's injury being done by the feeding, um, but there's not really damage. Um, you're not losing money as a result of that feeding. And so in most cases, um, there are exceptions, like if you've got young plants that are just gonna you know, be completely annihilated, um, you might wanna do something. But in most cases, um, again, from an economic standpoint, it costs money to do something, it wouldn't make sense to do it because you're not saving uh, the loss as a result of that feeding. Um, and so this, as, as an entomologist, I have to show you this graph. Um, and so basically this is a hypothetical pest population over time. So on the x-axis you've got time and on the y-axis is the density um, of that pest over time. Um, and there's two important um, sort of thresholds or levels of population density that you want to understand, right? So there's the economic injury level. So this is how, if you've got a pest population and the feeding as a result of that insect or the damage as a result of that disease is going to make you lose money, right? That's the economic injury level. But you don't want to, if you have to take action to avoid getting to that level, you don't want to wait till your population is that high. And so we have economic thresholds that we use. So that's a level below the injury level that you should consider taking action um, because you don't wanna wait till the problem is actually causing the loss of money. You wanna prevent that loss from ever happening. And sometimes what, whatever you do takes a little bit of time to take effect. So thresholds really quickly are great. We don't really have a lot of economic thresholds developed for hemp production, um, particularly in the Northeast. Um, and so this is like what, what we would love to have because that's like a formula. You know that for you know, X number of plants, if you've got Y number of aphids, you do something. Again, we don't have a lot of that information yet. Um, and so really important is the, um, the combinations of a whole bunch of, um, of, of um, What's the word I'm looking at? Ah, whatever. So different strategies that work together, right? You don't want to be doing one thing and then something else that conflicts with that, right? So um, you want to focus on managing the problem. You're not going to eliminate it, right? And you do that management proactively. You do a whole bunch of things ahead of time to re prevent ever having the problem. If you do and there's nothing else that you can deal with, uh, you nothing else that you can do to deal with it, then you think of chemicals. And there are organic chemicals as well as um, conventional chemicals. Um, but for the most part, in, at least in the Northeast, uh, most growers are going uh, organic for, for hemp. Um, monitoring is the cornerstone of IPM. Um, this is actually a, just a screenshot of a, um, of a data sheet that, um, that um, 
and Hazel Rigg uh, and her group developed for, for scouting in hemp. Um, and you'll see that you go out and the procedures are pretty typical. Um, you you want to hit most areas in the, in the field um, and in most areas in a plant. Um, you don't want to just go out to one plant, look at one leaf and then make your decisions based on that. So you want to kind of check out what's going on throughout the field uh, and also throughout the plant. And you want to be making notes. You want to be keeping track ideally a weekly scout, um, or maybe during really um, critical stages um, more than once a week. Um, but you really wanna know what's out there. And this is diseases, but we also have one for, for insects. Um, so the things that you can do, your behavior, um, your, your activity to, to minimize pests. So um, sanitation, getting rid of crop residues, um, and plowing in stuff um, that you can't get rid of, weed control, um, is really important. So cultivating and cover cropping, um, and then thinking about your rotations and what's next to your plants, um, it, it can be really important for certain pests. Uh, and then also transplanting um, hemp relatively early um, so that the plants have a, a chance to harden. Um, also some other considerations, I have some here for indoor and also outdoor. So things like avoiding, uh, reducing the relative humidity is obviously not an outdoor um, um, control strategy. That's for your greenhouses. Um, but these are all sort of common sense um, uh, tactics that, that apply for, for a whole bunch of different pests, both diseases uh, and insects. Uh, I, Biological control, I said before, I could spend hours talking about this. This is just a, a, a smattering of biological controls um, that are commercially available. There's a whole host of good things out there that I mentioned earlier that you don't have to buy. They're just there doing the good work for you. Um, but these are biological control agents that you can purchase and then release. Um, and, and a big one that people are talking about is trichogramma. Um, again, trichogramma has been and will continue to be used a lot for corn borer in corn and in peppers, um, but people are realizing, um, oh, I can also use those in hemp. And so these parasitoids, they lay their eggs inside of um, the, the corn borer egg. So they're egg parasitoids. Um, but there are a whole bunch of others, um, aphid midge, um, uh, par a predatory fly that specializes on aphids, um, but there are ones that you can get from mites. Um, and then uh, there are, excuse me, biological control agents that you can purchase for mite control. Um, and um, this is my favorite. So the spider mite destroyer is great because one, they're naturally occurring, um, but you can also buy some in uh, to get extra, um, extra help uh, if need be. And there are na big national suppliers like Arabico Organics out of California, I think. But then there's also more local uh, suppliers like IPM Labs in Lockport, New York, I think, um, that, that traffic in, in biocontrol agents. Um, so again, last resort, nothing else is working. You're watching your pest populations grow over the season and you're like, oh no, I, I need to do something, right? Beforehand, know what is allowable in your state. So um, I, I, um, I put up here the National Pesticide Retrieval System. Um, it's, a, it's a kind of quasi-national system. Uh, it has, I think, 30 or 40 states upload their data. Um, and so that's kind of a, a clearinghouse, if you will. But, but check with your state. Um, and remember, the label is the law. Um, and so whatever is on the label and whatever your, your state agency says, um, do that. And, and so I smiled earlier, Heather mentioned that the buyer beware. So that, that applies in pest management as well. So um, Marone Bio Innovations, really reputable um, purveyor of um, like biologicals. The, the most common is probably regalia. Um, regalia is a, is a biofungicide um, made from uh, Japanese knotweed, right? labeled for, for organic, labeled for hemp. In fact, in Vermont, I can't say for sure in Massachusetts, um, but um, on their website, this is their cannabis pest guide. Um, at the time, and I looked this up a couple weeks ago for a presentation, this presentation that I put together, the EPA um, has um, those products registered, um, but they're not registered on hemp in Vermont. Uh, and I don't know again about Massachusetts. So just because the, the website says that it can be used doesn't mean it's allowable. Um, and in fact, a, a really weird one was this new product, JetAg, 
was registered in Vermont, but not registered for use on any um, plant in Vermont. So maybe they're in the process and it was just like that. I, got, I looked it up just in that weird time. So again, make sure that you're, you're following the label, but also whatever the state agency um, that's responsible for pesticide registration says. So really quickly, know the good guys, the bad guys, um, both the, the insects and mites and diseases, um, what the symptoms look like, so that when you go out into your field, um, you can think holistically, all right, what are all the things that I can do ahead of time? What am I starting to see? Am I starting to lose money? And if so, or am I going to lose money? And if so, what are my options? Um, and so again, being informed and proactive are crucial um, for those pieces. So I think I have two minutes, um, and I saw a couple of questions popped up. Um, and it doesn't have to be about pest management. Um, it could be about any of the information that, that Heather and I uh, presented this evening to you guys. Um, and I, to be honest, Kara, I was not paying attention to the questions. Yeah, no, I don't think we have any questions. I just put a bunch oh. of like end of session. Analysis. <laughs> but now would be a good time, folks, if you do have questions to just go ahead and go off mute and ask them live. If, if no one else has a question, I did um, just have one um, for you, Scott. I noticed in Heather, the um, um, soil test that Heather uh, shared, um, she had like a 77% base saturation, I think. Um, and I'm wondering if you have seen um, any sort of correlation between lower pest and disease pressures as you get sort of higher on that base saturation with your calcium. So I don't know about, there are some um, pests that, that like with nitrogen, for instance, um, like really well-fed plants, you'll have higher um, aphid populations. Um, and so there are mm -hmm. certainly some nutrients where you increase um, the, the um, concentration of the nutrient and you promote um, uh, some pests. And then others where you, if you have a deficiency, um, you have a more susceptible um, plant to disease. Um, but Heather, do you want to chime in um, on calcium specifically? Yeah, I haven't seen I haven't seen anything, um, but that we haven't really looked either. So I know mm -hmm. that um, there is a school of thought on you know sort of higher levels of calcium and more pest resistance, but we haven't evaluated that. Specifically. Thanks. I was just curious. I know it's not uh, often researched in uh, academia, so I was just curious. <laughs> Thanks. Our next Anyone else have project. a question before we? Um... Oh, awesome. That would be great. <laughs> hey. Um, Any other questions? So for this... Oh, sorry. What was that? Delay. Sorry. Oh, oh no worries. <laughs> Um, yeah, thank you so much for this talk. This was like super informative. I'm um, personally growing hemp myself right now this summer. So um, as an it, this was like an intro to IPM for me and like an intro to so many other sources from um, Heather's talk earlier. So thank you, first of all. Um, I have a question, I guess, about the pest management in terms of so for like the monitoring stage, like as or all stages are monitoring stages, but um, as you're monitoring your field, I guess like for new growers, maybe I, I'm asking in the sense of how to be evaluating basically the injury that may be done to you, like what, how bad is the problem essentially? How do you start making those decisions about like when you might start needing to take action? Um, you know, like is some population okay and you should just like let them do their thing? That sort of thing is kind of like what I'm getting at. I think the biggest thing to answer your question, Nina, is is being able to diagnose the problem. So, and so like, again, if you're seeing a whole bunch of, the, the example I gave with Japanese beetles, if you're seeing a whole bunch of Japanese beetle damage and know that it's Japanese beetles, then you can go and seek out the information and, and find that, oh, Japanese beetle damage is, is not a big deal. Mm. Whereas, you know, if you were seeing the damage as a result of corn borers, you know that that's a little bit bigger of a deal. Um, and so diagnosis is the most important piece. Um, and then there's information out there generally um, about at what point you should start worrying. 
Um, and there's not, it's not a hard and fast rule per se. It's not like, all right, you see, you know, 17 aphids and that means you need to, you know, spray. There's, there's a, there's a spectrum, if you will, of um, like people's comfort level um, with taking action. There are some, some people that want to have more control and will add more input, inputs into the system in order to have more control. There, but as a result, you have to put more money in, right? So there, there are those, the, the, um, the trade-offs associated with taking action. Can I just ask um, what, like, do you have any preferred sources for, um, or recommended sources for exploring how bad a population can, can get? For, for those so, different, yeah. Yeah, so again, I, as I think Heather mentioned, we don't have as much information uh, for the Northeast because we, we haven't been, in least, at least recently, been growing um, uh, cannabis legally. Um, and so a lot of the information is coming out of Canada um, or Colorado, and particularly um, Colorado for insects um, is like, for me, the go-to source for information um, because they've been growing legally there for much longer. Um, uh, now Kentucky, there's a lot of work down there as well. And so some of the, the extension um, sites for those states that have been growing uh, more recent, uh, have been growing for longer recently would be would be where I would go. Gotcha. Thank you so much. Thank All you right. so much for, <laughs> for having us. Um, and of course, if you have questions, um, our website was up, our email address is there, and we love taking questions over email. And feel free to email me, uh, caro at nofamass.org. Thanks again. Oops, sorry. Oh, thanks everyone. Have a good night. Thank you so much, Heather. Thank you so much, Scott. Thanks everyone for being here tonight. Bye everybody.